Greetings everybody, Zap Anderson from Autodesk here and uh, we're going to get into lesson 3 of my course in writing OSL shaders and we're going to talk about shapes and drawing things and a little bit uh, nerdy theory about coordinate systems. So here we go. If you want to draw something on screen like a circle, how do you do that? The answer is you don't. If you look in the PDF, the OSL language spec, and you try to search for circle, there will be zero hits. There's math functions, there's all sorts of things, there's no such thing as circle. But how do you do a circle? The answer is, that's the wrong question. The question is not, how do I draw something? The question is, Given a point, a coordinate, let's call it Q for now, the query point, how do I know if Q is on my thing? So, basically, the question is not how do I draw a circle, it's rather, given the fact that we have a circle, how do I determine that a given point is on it? This point is not on it, this point is not on it, this point is on it. So in the particular case of a circle, you have a center point, you have an inner radius, and you have an outer radius. So when we want to check a point if it's on the circle, we measure the distance from the center to our point that we're given. We compute this distance and we check is it greater than the inner radius and less than the outer radius. If this is true, we are now on our circle. A different example, a rectangle. We have a rectangle with the lower left corner, a coordinate, and a coordinate for the upper right corner. Now we're given a queue, a query point, where we want to determine if it's inside or outside. Well, in this case, we can basically check if the x-coordinate of the cue point is greater than the leftmost one, which is the lower left, and if it's less than the rightmost one, the upper right. And same for the y-coordinate, that the cue point is greater than the lower left's y-coordinate and less than the upper right's y-coordinate. In code, it looks like this. Remember that the bracket syntax was used in OSL to determine which component, so you don't say dot .x, etc. You say 0 in brackets is x, 1 in brackets is y. So this is literally saying if the x-coordinate of q is greater than the x-coordinate of the lower left and the x-coordinate of q is less than the x-coordinate of the upper right and the same for y. It's pretty straightforward. But what about the rotated rectangle? What if the rectangle sits like this, and we have our points, lower left, upper right? Well, you need to bring out your protractor, and you need to draw some angles, and some cosine theta, and there's going to be lots of math, right? Well, actually, no. There's a much simple solution for the rotated rectangle case. We don't do that. We don't do strange math. Rather, if you want to figure out if a point is inside a rotated rectangle, it's super simple, actually, to rotate the coordinate system. When we do that, then we can still use the simple test of just testing if the x-coordinate is within the range and the y-coordinate is within the range, but we need to do it on the rotated coordinate system. Let me try to do some examples for you. Okay, so we're back where we ended last time with our dotty thing in screen space. Uh, now, a little bit has happened in Mac since then. For instance, we have way better support for OSL now in the viewport. If you pick realistic materials with maps, you will see that our OSL shader runs just fine in the viewport and not only under Arnold Active Shade. Of course, we also have this cool thing where we can actually run the Active Shade directly in the viewport. But for the uh, sake of comparison, I'm going to keep 
this running the viewport and I'm also going to keep an active shade running up here so they should be the same there might be some case sometimes where they're actually not and if we run into that it will be interesting interesting result here's her code from last time and it was making dots in screen space I'm actually going to really concentrate on texturing on the plane here so I'm going to go back to traditional UV space by hooking that shader up and just setting the scale to 1 I'm even going to get rid of the, I'm going to hide this teapot because I don't really need it we're going to think more about stuff on this one plane here and I'm even going to take out some of the code so we're not using it. We're just going to say that f equals 0 right now, uh, which will make everything yellow because this is the color for when the value is 0 and the blue one, which obviously is not used when I'm setting it to 0, uh, will be used for when the value is 1. We can even um, put these within comment markers everything within these kind of markers uh, the dash star and the star dash means all this is a comment you can write whatever in here the compiler won't care what you write it's a way to kind of stow away code you're not using right now but we might get back to later this function I'm actually still using so here we are a uh, function that kind of does nothing so what about circles well to make the circle we said we needed a center point and a radius maybe a width and stuff like that so just start by declaring these variables so we have a point we call it center the default value you might want to put it in the middle of the unit square so 0 0.5 0 0.5 we're not using the z coordinate here so just x y is 0 0.5 don't forget the comma we need a float which is the radius and we set some also default 0.5 don't forget the comma and let's stay with that for now okay compile I get new parameters center and radius okay so how do I do this let me think so there's a few things we can ways we can do this we can make a new float called distance not just dist for simplicity and I will set this I want to compute the distance between the point we got here after applying the scale and stuff and our center point hmm how do I do that well I can look in a PDF here and see distance is there something called distance in here and I search around and I will find well, the word is used all over the place but we'll find there is indeed a function called distance in the standard OSL library which returns the float value and its input is a point P0 and a point P1 so it returns the distance between two points this is exactly what we want by the way uh, and um, we're going to do this so we say dist equals distance from what's the first one well it's the point we computed up there and the other one is center don't forget the semicolon at the end let's compile this still compiles I hit F7 to compile it okay so now if we are if the distance is shorter than the radius that means we're in the circle so if we say if distance is less than radius then we want to set F to 1 don't forget semicolon boom we have made a circle if we play with it and see we can turn down the radius yes we can change the center point in the u direction and the v direction exactly as expected this is awesome now the way we did this though was, was with an if statement and you can do it with an if statement it's not completely illegal to do it with an if statement but for reasons of particularly has to do with bump mapping in the future it might be better to use um, some built-in functions to do it and there happens to be a function called step um, and the step function returns a value which is zero it has two inputs one called edge and one called 
the basically the value, the x value, and it says it returns zero if x is less than edge and one if x is greater than edge. Okay. So why would I use this function instead of just the if statement? I'll explain this in one second. But let's see. We want to want to make the same thing kind of happen, but using this step function. Okay, so let's go back to our code and say that, let's see now, uh, we, we simply say that f is equal step, and the edge is, of course, well, it will be the radius. And the thing we're kind of comparing against is the distance, the dist, okay, semicolon, and we compile and we see it worked, except Anyway, we got the wrong. <laughs> it it's the backwards thing to what we wanted. So it was one when we before had zero and the other way around. We kind of want it to be one inside the circle. We want the blue inside the circle. Well, we simply then compute it as one minus the value. So say one minus whatever this is, and we will get the opposite result. Now you may wonder why why the step function? Why, why do we care? Uh, like it, it was working fine before. Well, if we're looking really carefully here in the viewport, you will see this actually this edge is a little jaggy, and I can demonstrate that if I go in actually to the Arnold render settings and set a really low sampling here, you'll see that there's no filtering on this edge. You see the stair step pixels because this, this is either one or zero. It's never in between. There's no filtering happening here. There's no anti-aliasing happening. So there's actually an alternate function that's simply called AA step for anti-aliased step. If I use this function, you will see this is now smoothed out and anti-aliased. You can also kind of tell here in the viewport. So when you're using step functions, you can actually get kind of, you have more ability to get cooler results because I will also show you this. Um, there is a another one called linear step. We look in the manual again. You see there's a linear step and it has two edges. Basically, if we're below edge zero, it will return zero. If we're above edge one, it will return one, and in between it will be like a fade between these two. Ah, interesting. So AA step, which we used now, kind of did this for us magically based on anti-aliasing, but let's try linear step. So we say linear step, and then we need two values. So we say radius, and we say radius plus, put some small value, 0 0.05 or whatever. We'll see, now we get like a fuzzy edge. I'm mean, going to be a little clever here and add a new new input called fuzz and put it, set it to 0 0.05, comma. Don't forget up here it lists its commas, just to remember. And set fuzz here. Of course, now since it had the same value, it will look the same, but now I can tweak this one and define how fuzzy edge I want. And now I'm going to show you something kind of interesting. I'm going to change this intentionally to just white and black uh, for illustrative purposes. And you will see something kind of interesting. Especially if I shrink the radius of this one and I might decrease the fuzz. Whoops, see Daisy. Decrease the fuzz a little bit. Do you see this? kind of white line around here. It looks like it's almost brighter. So it's black here, it fades off, but it's almost like a white line. I'm going to tell you something. This line is in your head. This line, this bright area, doesn't exist. It has to do with how our brain interprets changes in brightness. And when we go from dark to light in a linear way and then suddenly just go to flat, the brain wants this ramp to continue. And the brain thinks it continues and only after a few millimeters realize that, wait, it's not continuing, but the brain thought it did. That's why it looks like it's bright here. It's really freaky. Psycho-optics is one of the most interesting things in the entire universe. So to solve that, 
linear step is actually not a good thing. There's something called smooth step. There's a function called smooth step. We can look in the manual and see it has exactly the same parameters as linear step, but it uses a smooth function. So compare now, when I compile this one, you will see that the look of the fuzz is slightly different. And it has to do, and sometimes you might even perceive a little of this brightening effect. It depends, it changes from person to person. But basically, instead of having a curve that is a line that fades down and is flat, it basically smooths over the curve. So it's like a ramp that smoothly fades. So smooth step is really nice for doing these kind of things. And it also becomes very important for bump mapping. And this is one of the reasons that we uh, do these kind of things. If I were to switch this, which I no, now have connected to the color, and actually connect it to the bump, you see that we have this kind of indentation. I should turn the quality back up here. There we go. We have this little indented bump going on here in the material. And the reason there is an indented bump here is because we have a smooth change. If this change was instantaneous, it was like one 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 zero 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 zero, there will be no ramp. When there is no ramp, you will get no smooth edge. When there's no smooth edge, you will not get any bump. And so if I went back to the version of the code that just used step and took away the second parameter, you will see that while the viewport does something, there's a tiny little edge here, although it's very dotty and ugly, it completely disappeared in the rendering. There has to be some kind of fade. One really good way to get the fade is to deal with smooth step stuff. So we're going to we're going to play a little with this. Now, let me plug this back to the color. There we go. So we now have a little dot with a settable amount of fuzz around the edges. We can put very little if we want. We can have a radius and we can move it around. But what we wanted was not a dot, we wanted a circle. So how do we make this a circle. Well, we need the circle to have a width, so let's add some new variable called width. Uh, we call, say, point 0.1, for instance, as a default. Compile that, we see we add the width here. So, what is it we want to do? Let me think. So, now we're setting this value. When we're inside the circle, it's 1 because we're getting that value, the black value. When we're outside the circle, it's zero. Okay. And we want a different computation for like a second circle, which is the circle with s that is as much smaller as this width is. So, so let's just, for step one, we just copy this line. So, and we will deal with the radius minus width so we make like a smaller circle inside the circle and again radius minus width okay so we do that now of course the only thing we did we just picked the smaller circle uh, because this value here got overwritten immediately by that line but we want to make some kind of combination between the two so what if we this value is one inside the circle and zero outside the circle and so is this value what do we flip this value around which we do by simply removing this this you know one minus in the beginning so now this value is the opposite right it's the one it's one when it's outside the smaller circle and it's zero when it's inside the smaller circle so if we just compile this you'll see it will flip flip around here right so what if I multiply this value with that value? And so we can do that by just saying star equals. That is a shorthand for f l equals f times something. Uh, I can just as well say f times.
times equals. It means it takes the value of f, multiplies it with whatever is on the right side, and shoves that back into f. Compile that, and boom, we have, via some math, been able to make a circle. So again, what are we doing? Let's break it down. This piece here is computing a value that is 1 outside of the bigger circle and 0 inside of the bigger circle. We didn't want that, we wanted the opposite, so hence we added this 1 minus. So this entire thing is computing something that is 1 inside the bigger circle and 0 outside the bigger circle. This bit computed something that was 1 outside the smaller circle and 0 inside the smaller circle. Multiplying these together we get something that is 1 only when it's both inside the bigger circle and outside the smaller circle, so this area here. We can test that this works, we can change the radius, we can change the width, we can even make it fuzzy because we were doing all this with smooth steps. See? Fancy. We made a fuzzy edge circle kind of function. And it's pretty neat. It does kind of does what we want. We can even scale it here. But wait. First of all, there's two problems now. First of all, we only have one scale. We, wha what if we want to make this ability to make the circle, you know, both change the width and height of it? That would be kind of cool, right? And we can do that super simply by simply saying that this float we call scale, we instead call this a vector. And I should set the default to 1. And without even changing the code, let me recompile this. Bang! You see this change, so I now have three values. Of course, the z is not used, only the u and v used. But if I change this now, this is the scale in the u direction. And this is the scale in the v direction. And that is all fine and dandy, but if I move it over here and want to scale it, you see it's kind of flying off. It's like we're scaling we're scaling it around the zero zero point. Now if you think about it and look at the code, it's not really strange. We get some point which is the UV of the the square here. Zero zero down there, one one up here. We divide it by some scale, and then we compute the distance to a center point and do our circle thingy, right? Now, think about it. Of course, this will scale around 0, 0 down here, because th those are the coordinates that we're making bigger or smaller with the scale operation. Can we do this differently somehow? What if we, wanted, we want to scale our circle around the center of the circle? That's way more useful, right? We want to be able to, to like place our circle somewhere, then scale it. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, it's actually about what you do in which order. So let's take the scale out here first. So remove that. I'll compile it and we'll see our circle will go back to the fixed scale. And then I will compute a new uh, vector which I call diff for difference and that vector will be the difference between the center point and this computed point and I can do this just by subtracting them so say the the point minus the center so this new point this new vector is like the difference between wherever the center is and wherever the the point we're measuring so what I do instead of computing this as the distance between the point and the center, I will simply compute it as the length of the different vec difference vector, or the diff vector. And yes, there is a function called length already. Uh, I don't even have to look it up, trust me on this. So I say uh, length diff here. And when I do this, it will do exactly the same. So the, the difference is really, I'm computing the difference first, the difference between point and center, and then I'm taking the length of this difference vector. But now comes the cool part. What if I apply our scale right here to the difference vector? 
So I will divide this by scale, and as I said, to divide something and plug it back in the same vari variable, you can do divide equals, which means you take the diff, you divide it by scale, and plug it back into diff. Let's compile this, and now we see we have scales that scales around the center of the circle, we can stretch our circle, and we can move it, and now, like, it feels more independent, like this is moving and this is scaling. It's much more useful this way, you have a way more understanding of what's going on. Uh, so this is extremely useful. But if you think of what we're doing, we're really changing the coordinates, right? We are changing the coordinate system, so we're kind of moving, sort of moving it down to the center and then scaling it around the center, sort of. But the visual result is kind of the opposite. It's as, as if we were scaling the object and then moving it somewhere. So the operations that show up in the code is kind of the opposite of the way the operations feel. Uh, let me add something more to make that more clear. Let's say you want to be able to rotate it as well. So let's throw in another variable, let's call it angle. And uh, we just set that at zero at first. Compile this, look, bang, angle shows up. So how do I want to rotate something? Well, we can look up in our little PDFs, is there something called rotate? And we search, and indeed there is, there's a function called rotate, it returns a point. And you input some point, you give it an angle, and then you give two other points. And these other points is like an axis which the rotation is around. This might sound confusing, but I will show you exactly how it works. So, we start by the naive thing and say we want to rotate our circle. So we say that the point that we compute here, we want to change it to be the rotated point. Rotate point by the angle variable here. Um, and then what's the axis? Well, we just want to rotate around the center, so we say 0, 0, 0, and we want to rotate it around the z axis, so we say 0, 0, 1. So this defines the point around which we want to rotate and the axis from that point, or really uh, the second point of that axis. Trust me on, on this, this will basically be uh, rotate in, in the XY plane. Let's compile this and see what happens if we apply some rotation. And you see, we kind of end up in the same kind of problem now. This is rotating around the 0, 0 again, the, the 0, 0 um, UV coordinate again. And that's not what we want. So basically, we put this in the wrong place. So what we want to do is actually rotate this difference vector we just made. So we move this line down here and change this to diff and diff. And now you'll see our rotation operation will indeed happen around the center of the stretchy thing. What happens if we put the rotations last? you might wonder. We will do that as an experiment and it will appear not to work. But you're actually rotating the circle, but you're rotating the circle around the circle, which obviously does nothing. So again, if we want to make it feel like we are taking something, we're first like moving it somewhere, scaling it, rotating and whatever, we basically need the code to do those operations in the opposite order on the coordinate system. So now it f kind of feels like we're taking a thing, you know, we're placing it, we can place it somewhere, we can rotate it somewhere, we can scale it in the different axis, but we're, what we're actually doing is taking the coordinates moving them somewhere, rotating them, and then scaling them. I hope this kind of made some sense. So here we have made the, the circle case. What if we want to do that rectangle we just did? We already kind of solved the rotation and moving and scaling, but what if we want to swap out the circle for a rectangle? Let's try that now. 
So to do the rectangle, we start by getting rid of stuff we don't need. So let's, for the moment, get rid of all this. We're back to f equals 0, which just will make the whole thing white. And we will change some of our inputs. We don't want to call it... Well, we can still... Actually, we can reuse the inputs, but we're going to rename this to be width uh, instead. No, wait, we only have that. Size. Let's call it size. Size of the rectangle. So, we want to compute a rectangle. Now, we already did the hard part, so we kind of moved our rectangle to where we want already. We've rotated it and we scaled it. So, all we want to do here is basically make sure is this point we computed that we have so far, basically this difference vector which is the difference from the center of the rectangle to wherever point we're at. How do we know this is within the rectangle? Well, we can start with the if version first. We say that if, to similar to the code I showed before, if diff 0, which is the x coordinate of diff, is less than negative size. Remember now, we're working around the center of the rectangle now, in the way we did it here. So we want to go from anything from negative side to positive size that's inside. So we say if diff 0, meaning x-axis, is less than negative size and we do the double AND sign, diff 0, x-axis, is greater than size and can bring a new line, say diff for 1, which is the y-axis, is also less than size Oops. Size and diff for the y-axis is greater than size. If all this is the case, we set f to 1. Hopefully now we should see a rectangle, which we don't. So we did something wrong. If it's less than... Oh, of course, these are backwards. It has to be greater than negative size course it has to be less than size I did this backwards see it's easy to do things wrong here in the boom this my friend is a rectangle and it's already rotated and everything with the stuff we have the center setting everything works the same the only difference is instead of computing uh, ourselves that circle thing, we have computed ourselves a rectangle. Amazing! Let's set the scale to 1 to make it simple. Size to smaller. Move the center back to the middle. But this was using if. So let's think about what would this mean if we were using the step function. Well, let's take this piecemeal. So we start with the simple case of just using step. So we say, and we just take the left edge to make sure we do that right. So we take one edge at a time. So we say f is equal to step. And where's the border? The border is at minus size. And the variable we're comparing is diff 0, the x-coordinate. So what does this turn out to be? Yep, yeah, it's the right thing. It is 1 when we're to the right side of that line. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, now we want to be 1 also when we're on the left side of the right line. So you might figure out what this is already. Uh, if we do just that, so I will copy this line for now, and say positive size. If I just do this, you will have it white on this side and black on this side. But we want it the other way around, so this has to be 1 minus this, right? So now it's black on this side, which means returning 1 from this function, and white on this side. And if we multiply these things together, again, remember the multiply equals trick, boom, we have our left and right edge. Awesome. So we just need to do the same for the top and bottom. So I would just steal this code and say do the same for the y-coordinate. 
and change this to a multiply equals. That means if it's to the right side of this it will be 1, if it's on the left side it will be 1, if it's above the bottom it will be 1, if it's below the top it will be 1, and all these things multiplied together are only 1 within the square, and boom, we get exactly that. We could change this now to AA step for the anti a list one, but uh, let's go straight for the smooth step everywhere. But now we have to think a little. Smooth step needs two edges. And now we have the minus size. So we want to have the fuzz amount in here. So the other edge is minus size plus fuzz. And then we have this one. Uh, now remember, the edge size is the very right side, so we actually, to get the two edges, uh, they have to be in the right order. Let's do the naive thing here. We say size minus fuzz here. I'll show you what this is wrong in a moment. And we copy this sign, so it's minus size plus fuzz. Same here. Not fizz. It should be fuzz. And size and size minus fuzz. I will compile this and see it worked great on these two edges but not on those two edges. Why? Because these edges actually have to be in the right order so this has to be the lower value and this has to be the higher value and since this is negative we're removing something we actually need to swap this out to be on this side so there we go so on the right and top edges we go from size minus fuzz to size on the x-axis here and the y-axis there and there we go now we have a rectangle with a fuzzable edge we can set the fuzziness fantastic so now we just have to compute the inner rectangle. So how do we do that most easily? I mean, we want to do exactly the same as here. So let's make it s really simple. Let's copy this entire thing. Now we already used the variable f, so let's call this like g or something. So we do this on g, 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 g. And then we need to do it in a different size. We want a size that is smaller than the outer edge. So let's make a new variable, say float i size, which is the inner size, which is simply size minus width. And then everywhere in this code where it says size, I will just replace it with i size. So i size everywhere. That's four places. Oh, eight actually. Compile this, it compiles. To just test it, I will say like f equals g. And we see that yes, we have now, this is now the inner rectangle. Of course, I want this to be the opposite. So it should be 1 minus g because I want the outside to be the one where I have my color. And again, then if I multiply this outer rectangle that has 1 on the inside and 0 on the outside and this inner rectangle I will get my there we go we have a rectangle with the width I can set with the fuzziness I can choose with the rotation I can pick and a scale that aligns with my rectangle pretty cool right so as you see, we're not drawing things. We're making math to show where within a thing we are and we basically return a value based on where within the thing we are. Before ending this, I will add a little special magical wrinkle because you know rectangle and circles are kind of boring and we want to do more interesting things than that, right? So I'm going to throw in a little thing here. Float dist equals zero and dist scale equals 0 0.1 for instance so what is this 
Well, I'm going to do a little preview on next episode for what we can do with this. So imagine I just want to wiggle these coordinates around a little and kind of distort our rectangle. We can do that with something called a noise function in OSL. So if we search for noise, you'll find there's a whole bunch of noise functions. But it's basically a function called noise, which takes a string noise type. And one of the most basic one is called Perlin noise. And then it takes some input, which can be floats or points or all sorts of things. And it returns some value that is random, varying based on this input. Sounds technical. Let's play with it. So I'm going to compute a random vector. Call it uh, distort. And it's going to come from noise. So noise. And I want to use Perlin noise. So I just write Perlin here. And the input value is my difference vector. Or no, I will actually input the original UV point. Yeah, I think that is better. I will input the original UV point here. And I will divide it by my dist scale. There we go. And I will multiply it with my distort amount, which, as you might recall, I set to zero. Let's compile this and see if it works. Whoops, something long. Didn't I call it? I'll call it dist. There you go. Actually, one thing you can do is, if you forget things like this, and I forget a lot, I type dist. You see, now it lights up because it uh, exists somewhere else in the code. That's pretty neat. So now you know you won't be doing that mistake. Okay. So distort is now a random vector that would vary over by the UV. But it's scaled to zero and I'm doing nothing with it. So what do I want to do? What do I want to do? Well, I will just add to diff. I will add my distort vector. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if I turn my distortion up a little, you will see... Ooh, I am distorting my rectangle. Because I have random values that vary across, this is like the size of the variations, if they're really big, you see it kind of distorts slowly. I can put a lot of distortion on it, but it changes slowly. Or if I scale down the noise, we'll see it kind of distorts more wiggly. And this kind of stuff. So here you see how we can start making interesting and cool textures out of this. So this is just a little sneak peek to how we kind of actually use OSL to do interesting things rather than spheres and rectangles and circles. So it's a little introduction to the fun stuff we'll be doing. And noise is something we'll dealing be dealing with a lot. So that's it for the practical section now little bit more theory and then we're done for today. So a little bit propeller head science for the real nerds. We're going to talk theory about vectors and the difference between points, vectors and normals and why these types matter in OSL. Many other shading languages use things like a float 3 which contains an X, Y and Z and it's up to your code to deal with them for whatever. But in OSL it actually matters. So any global value that you get from OSL, like P, the point, I, the, the direction, and the normal, and all these things, they come in in a common coordinate space. And you don't actually know what that common coordinate space is, although for most things it's actually world. But you use the transform function to convert something which is in common space to some other space. So if you say transform world P in max, well, P was already in world, so nothing will actually happen but if you say transform object p you will get the point in object space you can transform the the other globals like the the normal and the, you can get the screen position with the screen coordinate system there's the non device non normalized device coordinate i think it is uh and there's a raster which is pixels and all these kind of things uh, the the trick here is though how all these things deals with the difference between points and vectors or normals. Normal is a very special kind of vector.
The way you should think about it is that points encode a position in space and vectors and normals encode a direction in space and not the position. So here I made some example. These are four points, but we're only really caring about this one. And this is a vector. Now, numerically, these have the same value. This is x coordinate is 0 and the y coordinate is 1 for both. So it's really only conceptually they are different. So points have a position, but vectors do not. So if you move a vector somewhere, kind of conceptually, they kind of drag their own coordinate system with them, so to speak. And as long as they point in a particular direction, it doesn't matter where they are. Um, you may think of them as, in this case, it's the normal of this circle, so it's pointing upwards. But it doesn't really matter where the circle is, uh, or even where the vectors is, or if there's multiple of them. All the vectors that point in the same direction are one and the same. They all are 0, 1. They're pointing up in this particular case. Now, if we were to rotate the vector like this, you will see that we rotate coordinates. The same thing happens to vectors and points. And actually, we added in the zero here because you can also think of the vector as a difference between two points. So in this case, the difference between this one and that one is this vector. When we rotated points, they rotated. When you rotated vectors, it also rotated. So what the hell is the difference? Well, if we move something, points move, but vectors, they don't move. At least not numerically. Actually, if we look at these values, you can think of this vector as the difference, again, between these two points. Um, you see the math checks out, this, this, this minus that is this value. So it's this direction, same as that one. So vectors don't move, points do. If I rotate it now in the other direction around some other point, it doesn't matter which point I rotate, the vector will just simply rotate. Whatever point I rotate stuff around or move this thing, the points will move and rotate around some different center, but the vector will simply just rotate and not move. Now, if we apply a scaling operation in some direction, I scale this up in this direction. So scaling does apply to vectors, but movement... So scale and rotate and options apply to vectors. Moves motion, or what is technically known as translation, to move something does not apply to vectors. Now, there's a very specific type of vectors that we call normals. And as we know, a normal is something that is 90 degrees to a surface. And when you use the data type normal, it tries to adhere to this. And when does this matter? Well, a normal is just a type of vector for everything but scaling, because when you scale it, something special happens. Look at this thing, and imagine if we scaled this down vertically. If these were treated as regular vectors, they scale with everything. So everything becomes squashed vertically. But if you look at this is 90 degrees... Okay, this graph is not perfect, but these are perpendicular to the circle. When I squash it down, it's no longer perpendicular. But if you look at the right one, where these are treated as normals, you see it, they stay perpendicular. And how is that actually mathematically achieved? Well, as I said before, it doesn't matter where a vector is. You can think of them as being in the center always, like numerically, they all start at the origin. So the difference of scaling them as vectors or as normal is that the scaling is actually done in inverse. So you see, when I squash this down on this side, you see what's happening. It's squashing the vectors down vertically. Whereas on the right side, where they're normal, it's actually applying the inverse scaling. So it's actually growing the normals when it's scaling down vertically.
This will keep them perpendicular to the surface. But note how they grow in length and as we most normally in our code want normal to stay normalized having the length of 1, we often have to do, when we do a transform of a normal, we actually have to throw in the normalize function, which will shrink the length of the normal vector down back to the size of 1. So this, if we ever transform the normal and we need it like a normal object space, it's a really good idea to write it like this, normalize transform object n. Will we need to care about this in any of our shaders we write? Maybe if we do some fall-off thing that deals with vectors and stuff, but in most cases this is just good to know and it's really important when you dealing with transformations like these kind of transformations or transformation matrices which may show up a little later that points vectors and normals are treated differently points translate they move uh, rotate and scale vectors and normals they only rotate and scale and normals scale inversely to vectors and points Hope that was uh, enough exploding brain for today, and uh, that's all for lesson three. Have a glorious day. Zap out. Bye bye.